Presuming the little screen here means that the microphone's on and everybody can hear me. Yes, excellent. Well, thank you everybody for coming today. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation from whose land we're on and acknowledge our elders past and present. Uh, and thank you all so much for coming to this important rights talk. But I do in particular want to extend uh, a welcome to uh, Rosalind Croucher, the president of the Australian Law Reform Commission, who is currently conducting a major inquiry into uh, rights, freedom, traditional rights, freedoms and privileges and say that in addition to everybody here, uh, we, I want to extend my particular thanks for you coming to hear this important rights talk. Uh, my name, if you're not aware, is Tim Wilson and I am Australia's Human Rights Commissioner. Rights talks are designed so that the Commission can help fulfil its mission and mandate to educate Australians about human rights and freedoms and why they're so important. And a key focus uh, of my appointment as Human Rights Commissioner was to ensure that the Commission was an active participant in the promotion of human rights and freedoms. And that's particularly important in this, the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. It's a particularly important issue to ensure we are discussing human rights, not just in their contemporary context, but also their philosophical and historical origins. And that is what led us to invite today um, the illustrious guest which we are about to hear from, Professor Suri Ratnapala. Suri Ratnapala is a Professor of Public Law at the University of Queensland and a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Law. He holds the degrees of, uh, of Law from Colombo, a Master's of Law from Macquarie and a PhD from the University of Queensland and teaches constitutional law and jurisprudence, although I understand he retired from that position at the end of last year and is now Emeritus Professor. He has received fellowships from the prestigious International Research Centres, the Institute of Humane Studies, George Mason University in Virginia, the School, and, uh, School of uh, Philosophy and Policy Centre of the Bowling Green State University in Ohio and the International Centre for Economic Research in Turin, Italy. In 1998, his work received further recognition when he was elected to the membership of the Mont Pelerin Society the International Group of Intellectual Classical Liberals. In 2000, he received a John Templeton Foundation Award for his course, Advanced Constitutional Law and Theory. And it was granted on the basis of uniqueness, innovation and interdisciplinary and the balance of political, economic and social theory. Wow, that's quite a title. In 2003, he was awarded a Centenary of Australian Federation Medal by the Governor General of Australia for his contribution to Australian society through research in law and economics. In 2007, Professor Ratnapala has made, was made an Alan McGregor Fellow of the Centre for Independent Studies here in Sydney. You're not here to listen to me. So please welcome Dr Ratna Ratnapala to discuss rights, liberty and civilisation. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, Tim. Uh, uh, you uh, more or less disclosed the <clears throat> background from which I uh, approached this subject. And, uh, and thanks, every everyone, for uh, coming here at your, in your lunch hour. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite surprised that we have, I have such a uh, <clears throat> distinguished audience here. Um, it's not always possible in, in Brisbane, where I live, to get uh, an audience like this are uh, uh, <clears throat> coming for a lunchtime seminar, even in our university. Um, okay, so when I was invited to give a rights talk, I decided on this theme of rights, liberty, and civilization um, <clears throat> for a, from my point of view, for a very compelling reason. In my view, our, our civilization is founded on liberty, present, uh, protected by rights and democracy. It's like no other. The liberty that defines our civilization is an entitlement of every person, not only members of, a cho of chosen classes. Now, of course, this liberty is not absolute because absolute liberty is not possible in civilized society. <clears throat> the liberty of our civilization is the most extensive liberty that a person can enjoy without harming the similar liberty of others. Here, you can immediately 
you see that I'm quoting from John Stuart Mill. <clears throat> so I, I want to call this a liberal civilization. Now, I don't mean this in the local political sense of liberal, but in the more philosophical sense. This, of course, is an idealized picture. The reality is more complex. So let's see what our civilization really means. Now, in my view, there are three main attributes of the present liberal civilization from those of the past, which distinguish them from the past. The first feature is best described as openness. In liberal de democratic systems, every individual enjoys abstract legal equality. As John Rawls said, in a liberal society, all public offices and all private opportunities are open to all. In theory, at least, every person can aspire to every position. Every position. Society is not divided by birth or by force into men and women, masters and slaves, patricians and plebeians, aristocrats and commoners, high caste and low caste, hereditary monarchs and their families in constitutional monarchies are maintained by the public purse, but only as servants of the people and not as their rulers anymore. This, of course, does not mean that there are no remnant legal, economic, and cultural barriers to social and economic mobility. What it means is that persons have the legal capacity and practical opportunities to overcome these barriers through their own endeavors. Now, compare this with past civilizations. There is not one in which large sections of the population were not legally enslaved. Slaves were a tradable co commodity. The great cities and monuments of the ancient civilizations were built with slave labor. This was true even of the much admired Athenian democracy and the Roman Republic. You, recall, you might recall that Arist both Aristotle and Socrates, the great, two great philosophers of um, classical uh, Hellenic uh, philosophy, both justified slavery and the subjugation of women. This was true even of the much admired Athenian democracy and the, Ro and the Roman Republic, and even the Roman Republic true even of the pre-revolution Europe and, and America. Even free men and women were divided by social hierarchy and restraints of trade. <clears throat> now, the second distinguishing mark of a liberal civilization is what the economist Deepak Lal called Promethean growth. Past civilizations achieved extensive, extensive growth, partly through conquest. conquest. Extensive growth, as economists understand, is the increase of output by increasing input. Agriculture provides a classic example of this. In traditional agriculture, food production was increased by cultivating more land. And when all cultivable land is tilled, there is no capacity for further growth. The, this particular model of growth persuaded George Malthus to predict in 1798 that population growth will eventually outpace agricultural growth and lead to human catastrophe. It did not happen because agriculture, by achieving intensive growth, outpaced population. Something happened that led to the astounding scientific breakthroughs, technological innovations, discovery and extraction of vast new energy sources specialization through comparative advantage and the emergence of a global economic order based on cross-border trade. And that something was liberty. Liberty of individuals to own themselves and their property, to be free from physical harm by private or public agents, to enjoy the, the fruits of their labor and exchange, irrespective of birth status, to engage in scientific inquiry free of, ch of church or state control, and to pursue their chosen life ends without harming the similar liberty of others. This kind of liberty was attained in it, not in its perfect form, was not attained in its perfect form, and given the nature of human affairs, will never be perfect. There were many road roadblocks and setbacks, race, gender, 
political and other forms of discrimination did not disappear and remain with us today. Yet, beginning in the 16th century and continuing to our own times, in the nations that embraced the legacy of the Enlightenment, liberty was achieved to a degree that unleashed the, unleashed the potential for Promethean intensive growth. The third feature of our civilization is the compassion we show to those members of society less fortunate than ourselves. It is not that human nature has changed, but our economic circumstances have improved to the point where we can show concern not only to our near and dear, but also to strangers that we have never met, both in our own communities and abroad. There is debate across the political spectrum about the moral duty to assist those. There is no debate across the political um, uh, spectrum, as far as I can see, about the moral duty to assist those in need. The debate is about the means of helping by increasing opportunities through wealth creation, by private charity, by social insurance, through public transfers, or some mix of these means. This is a continuous and vigorous debate in, mat in mature democracies. That this can be conducted in a peaceful and democratic manner is further testament to the character of liberal civilization. Now let me spend a little time uh, on the subject of liberty, what liberty actually means and what rights mean. Now there are two kinds of liberty that a human being enjoys, to one extent or another. One kind is physical liberty, the capacity to live and to act subject only to the laws of nature. The other kind is the legal freedom from, from interference in our lives by human agents, whether be, whether it, whether be private or public. In a one-person setting, such as the world of Robinson Crusoe in Daniel Defoe's novel, that is before Friday turned up, the laws of nature were, um, were the only physical, are, only, are the only physical limits to freedom. However, most of us live in a social world where unrestricted, unrestricted enjoyment of physical freedom by one person can harm the physical freedom of others. If I have the freedom to drive my car on the right-hand side of the road or any side of the road, then the freedom of other motorists to drive safely would be severely hampered and their lives would be in peril. Social life therefore requires individuals to respect the, the freedoms of others by restraining their own con conduct. This is why societies have ruled rules concerning right and wrong con conduct. These rules operate by creating duties on persons and correlative rights in others. Now, the writer who most clearly set out the relationship between liberty and rights is an American jurist called Wesley Newcomb Hofeld. Now, Hofeld pointed out a person has a right because someone else has a duty that correlates to it. Now, I've spent a lot of time trying to test this proposition, and I have not been able to deny it. I have not been able to contradict it. You cannot find a right to exist unless there is a duty on some other person. So, in question time, if one of you is able to show me a duty that does not correlate to a right, or the other way about, I'll be most grateful, and it will, re will appear in my next edition of Jurisprudence <laughs> with, uh, uh, with, with acknowledgement to the uh, person who <laughs> provided the insight. It is possible in theory for a person to enjoy liberty without any duty arising in any, per any other person. Imagine that I go to a remote beach at midnight um, to swim in the sea. Now, that, this is of no concern to anyone else, except perhaps my family. Others have no right that I not swim, but they also have no positive duty to assist me in case I get into trouble, because this is a deserted place. They don't have to be there. If they're there, they have a duty to come to my assistance without harming their own, without risking their own lives, but not otherwise. Now, However, in most real life situations, I cannot enjoy my liberties without a host of protective rights. 
and correlative duties on the part of others. I will not, free, I will not feel free to, or at liberty to drive on the roads if I do not have rights that correlate to other to the duties of other road users to drive carefully and to avoid accidents. Traders have no liberty to trade unless they have enforceable rights under contract law and so forth. Although Hofeld was correct to notice that liberty and uh, liberty and rights are conceptually distinct, in practice, most of our liberties are unrealizable without protecting rights. Now I want to talk about rights for a moment. There are two kinds of rights. We, we, we often tend to forget this, that there are two very different kinds of rights. One kind has ancient roots, and the other kind is a product of recent legislation. The first kind is based on customary rules of conduct that grew insensibly with society itself and became the common law of the land. Now, it's not only England and Australia that has the common law. There is common law, there was common law in every other European country, in fact, every other country. It's just that the, the common law was codified in France and uh, in other parts of the civil law world, whereas in our case, much of it remains uncodified uh, in the form of judge-made law. Yeah, sorry. These rules are general. These are the rules that made li social life possible. They're found in every functioning society. In our society, we know them as the laws of crime, tort, and contract. They predate legislation. Some of these rules of conduct have been legislatively supplemented by organization, inspired by organizations such as the law reform commissions uh, and uh, modified to suit the changing world. There have been many salutary reforms in the field of private law and criminal law. Rights that flow from this kind of legislation enacting general rules of conduct bear the same character as the rights of the common law. Unfortunately, from time to time, misguided legislative changes to general rules seriously erode common law freedoms on which civilization has grown. Now, Section 18, 18C of the Racial, Racial Discrimination Act, to which I will refer once more a bit later, which outlaws acts that offend groups of people, is a startling example. Now, we also have some certain common law rights against the government such as the most fundamental rules that our rights cannot be restricted without the authority of the law, that laws cannot be created, that laws can be created only with the consent of the representatives, of our representatives, or that we must not be punished except by conviction after trial, after fair trial. Today, we take these rights for granted. They form the structure of our social order. We do not notice them very often because most people, most of the time, instinctively respect and observe the rules that give rise to them. If they didn't, we will not have society but anarchy. Now, the perennial problem is that fundamental rights dependent on the common law or custom are ever susceptible to destruction by rulers when they stand in the way of their ambitions. In liberal democracies, these tendencies have been held in check by formal and informal constitutional devices, representative democracy, and a culture of political restraint. Some countries have specifically entrenched these rights in their constitutions. Following the end of the Second World War, many of these rights and liberties were proclaimed as human rights by international instruments such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on, the civil, and, on civil and Political Rights. Now, the other kind of rights that we have are rights to specific benefits. Rights to specific benefits can only be created by legislative acts enacted for that purpose. General rules of conduct cannot assure specific material outcomes. Contract law does not assure that we will always profit from a contract. Criminal law protects life, liberty, and property, but what you make of your life and assets depend on your, depends on your own choices, actions, and circumstances. In contrast, legislation can make direct transfers or rearrange economic relations between parties. Parliament may create benefits by creating tax exemptions 
granting subsidies to industries or pensions of various sorts. It can, through tribunals, fix wages uh, or, and modify private contracts. The Commonwealth Parliament, in one case at least, has compulsorily acquired private houses without just compensation and given them to other persons. Legislation can impose price and quality controls in and in countries other ways, in and in countless other ways, make allocations and deprivations. It is easy to see, as the Austrian economist and philosopher F.A. Hayek pointed out, that this kind of legislation is very different to laws that enact general rules conduct. It is also ha not hard to see or that often rights to specific benefits can only be granted at the expense of rights derived from general laws. Uh, now, the Commonwealth Constitution prohibits uncompensated takings by the federal government, but not by the states. Um, affirmative action programs designed to benefit particular groups may discriminate against the poor members of other groups. The burden of tax exemptions and subsidies for particular groups are borne by other groups. One only needs to look at recent paid, the recent PPL, the Paid Parental Leave proposal, that I understand now has been abandoned. It is reported that in the United States, four times as much money go to the wealthiest 20% of Americans in mortgage interest reductions, deductions, than is spent on the house on housing for the poorest for poorest fifth. This is what economists call churning, a system that all parties in power practice to satisfy their respective constituencies. This is the negative phase of the electoral democracy. This is not to deny that members of a liberal society have no moral obligation towards their less fortunate fellows. The reason is that the liberty of a person is also limited by their economic circumstances. Even in our own age, millions have perished by starvation and disease. In Ukraine and China, tens of millions are thought to have died as a direct consequence of state policy. In Africa, similar numbers have died of starvation and disease. Millions of people in the third world today live on the edge of life-threatening poverty. How does civilization, our civilization address this material impediment to the enjoyment of life, liberty, and dignity? Now, it does not take long to notice that the greatest human catastrophes tend to happen in countries lacking in democratic, democratic or republican forms of government that assure basic rights and liberties to all citizens. In other words, they happen in countries that lack the institutions of a liberal um, civilization. Let me illustrate this point by contrasting the experience of the region around the Horn of Africa with that of India. By the way, I'm not Indian, so I'm not, you know, carrying a brief for India here at this point. Um, but look, Indian girl. Um, let me illustrate this point by contrasting the experience of the you know, Horn of Africa with India. In the second half of the 20th century, both regions suffered prolonged droughts and crop failures. However, post-independence India avoided this kind of, the, the kind of human catastrophe that occurred in Africa. India is not rich by Western standards. Its democracy is imperfect, and its governments are ponderous. Yet, India has certain priceless assets that the, that the African nations lacked. First, India is a parliamentary democracy with a federal system, within a federal system. An Indian government owns its survival to the consent of the electorate. A government that fails to act in a, in a national emergency faces electoral death. Second, Indian citizens live under a legal system that, that in, despite its inefficiencies, secures their basic rights and freedoms. Third, the Indian constitution has established a common market within which goods can move, however laboriously, to places where they are most in need. It was not always so. It's not always so. The Bengal famine of 1770 cost lives, the lives of 10 million peasants in one state. The country at the time was governed by the British East India Company, which was responsible only to its shareholders. Its pursuit of profits 
through predatory taxation of crops and the monopolization of the grain, grain trade contributed heavily to the drought, con drought conditions that led to the famine. Now, democratic governments can also cause grave hardship by ill-conceived restrictions on people's rights and freedoms. The infamous Corn Laws is one example, which worsened uh, the Irish famine. The most notorious democratically created disaster is perhaps the prohibition in the United States. In 1920, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution banned all trade in intoxicating liquor, re removing the basic freedoms of individuals to consume or trade in alcoholic drinks. The law had exactly the opposite effects to the intended benefits. It debilitated not only the liquor industry, but also the entertainment industry and the restaurant trade. It threw thousands of workers out of their jobs, increased crimes, cri increased crime, fostered bootleg whiskey that killed thousands, tens of thousands, enriched racketeers like the mafia boss Al Capone, and did nothing to improve the moral fiber of American society. So naturally, in 1933, it was, uh, it was, it was ended. The point I make here is this that the material conditions necessary to enjoy freedom tend to grow with freedom itself. Freedom, in, the other, in, in other words, creates its own means of enjoyment. Now we have this evidence of two respected annual economic survey, uh, freedom surveys, the Index of Economic Freedom and the Economic Freedom of the World Index by the Fraser Institute. Um, so, of course, None of this means that, that there are no persons in even the most affluent societies who need, who don't need material assistance because of factors such as age, disability, and other personal misfortune. In poorer countries, the burden of care of these persons fall on relatives and friends and voluntary associations with very little assistance from the government. Now, I grew up in a country and have intimate experience of this kind of responsibility. In wealthier countries, of course, we have many other forms of extending social security and welfare. There are voluntary ways such as insurance and superannuation schemes where employers and employees contribute to pension funds. <clears throat> there are, of course, compulsory saving schemes and, and, and of course, generalized disability and age pensions. The more problematic transfers that result from government regulation are the, those that result from government regulations and discretionary powers. Here, the burden, is, burden, burden does not fall on the community generally, but on particular individuals or firms. Let me give you one example. No one that I know think that the care of the environment is not important. However, the cost of this care falls disproportionately on the farming community which the law burdens with the responsibility of sequestering carbon. They generally receive no compensation for loss of land value and revenue. And their recourse to the courts is severely restrict restricted by law. If the environment is a, is a public good, its costs must be borne by the public. There are the examples from the manufacturing sector for uh, want of time I will not discuss. I do have a pay, written paper here. I'm not sure whether, you know, the HRC will be generous enough to make it available to people who are interested. But I have, I, I, I say that I, I do have a paper that can be, that can be accessed. Um, some con concluding thoughts. Now, I cannot conclude this talk without reference to the most direct, overt, and direct assault on freedom by the government in recent Australian history. And I refer to Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act. Much has been written about it. There, and, and my point here, to me, I, I, the point I want to make here is that it is an affront to one of the freedoms most vital to the emergence of our civilization, and that is the freedom of inquiry and discovery. As the philosopher Karl Popper explained in his magisterial work, The Logic of Scientific Discovery, Knowledge grows not by proof, but by rigorous testing and falsification of theories. 
This is no less valid in social and moral theory than it is in science. Take a religion, a religious faith, for example, particularly a creed that claims to be the one right way to organize society and the behavior of its members. This is a theory about the good life and the kind of social order that we all must have. Criticism of this theory will almost certainly offend the faithful, just as the theories of Galileo, Copernicus, Newton, and Darwin may have offended many persons of different faiths in the past. Yet there is no question in most parts of the liberal democratic world of prohibiting such speech, except, of course, in Australia. There have also been troubling departures from due process rights and freedoms of association, freedom of association, arising from crudely crafted legislation in response to terrorism and criminal gang activities. A liberal civilization is not a suicide pact. Often it requires a forceful defense against its many enemies. However, the means of defense has to be consistent with the values that are being defended. If not, liberal society will simply be doing the bidding of its enemies. The history of our civilization shows unmistakably that a society's prosperity and therefore its capacity for generosity is enhanced by freedoms protected by rights. If we are concerned about our fellow beings, we must be vigilant in the defense of freedom and the, and the fundamental rights that sustain it. It is easy to recognize overt attacks on freedom, but not the incremental and subtle erosions that occur often from by often by well well-meaning governments and therefore the defense of freedom requires vigilance on all fronts i thank you all for your patience well thank you very much siri i've just been handed the microphone and some ingenious way to get it put on properly. Uh, thank you very much, Siri, um, for that wonderful presentation and for giving an overview uh, of the philosophy as well as the practice in terms of liberty and what we have inherited as a society and how to foster it um, going forward. I thought one of the most interesting things you said was that uh, the rate of economic progress uh, to enjoy freedom is in of itself keeps up with the practice of actually enjoying freedom. Do you want to explain that though in a bit more um, detail about what, what you mean by that in terms of the enjoyment of freedom as well as uh, the rate of economic process that goes with it? Yep. Uh, you need the microphone. So, Just for our web, web people at home. Yeah. Um, I guess the point I was trying to make was that uh, in order to be generous you got to have wealth you know you it, you it's only people who have wealth that can be generous if you're a pauper you can't be generous to others so the first step in being compassionate is to have economic progress to have wealth um, and that's what I sometimes tell my students don't be ashamed of success I'm a lawyer Teacher, so my students are, are mostly very ambitious. Uh, they're not. They're not. Un, they're not guilty of success uh, by by any means. But I still have to remind them: don't be ashamed of success. Because if you're not successful, you're going to depend on someone else. But if you're successful, you can be of help to others. Now, the economic, the it is. It is, in my view, not possible to distinguish economic freedoms from other freedoms, from other basic freedoms. Um, you cannot have economic freedom without the other basic freedoms, and the other basic freedoms get threatened unless there is the economic prosperity of society. Um, I mean, I, I, I have experienced experience of living in third world countries, in third world um, conditions, uh, where the uh, liberties of the people ha are constantly threatened by the fact that people depend on 
government, almost everything, and people depend on, and, and the governments are able to manipulate the people and, uh, and, and use them in order to pursue their own ambitions. So it's a downward spiral. Um, the, the, the economic conditions of the country deteriorates with the erosion of the uh, institutions and, and, uh, and it becomes more and more difficult to retrieve. On the other hand, economic progress goes hand in hand, in hand with strong institutions and by which in our context what you mean rights and liberties. More rights and liberties creates more wealth and creates more opportunities and creates less dependence. And that's basically what I was trying to say. Right. We're open to questions from the floor if anybody has one. Um, Priscilla's got a microphone over here. So Priscilla, there's a question right up the front here. Uh, freedom of speech, which is almost unheard of in uh, do you put any inhibitions or restrictions on it? Yes, um, there are already in our legal system substantial limitations. Um, there are, for example, laws of def defamation in, on the civil law side, uh, and then there are on the criminal law side incitement to violence, treason, uh, sedition, um, any number of different limitations on speech. And uh, then of course, on the judicial side, there are serious restrictions on how we can react to, how we can criticize um, the actions of courts. So there are some of the limitations that already exist and which have grown with the freedom in the common law system. Um, and, I, and I'm certainly not encourage. I mean, I'm certainly not condone or, or, or oppose limitations on free speech um, calculated to uh, prevent uh, incitement to violence, for example. Mm. Can, can I ask just off the back of that then, just, and this may be what you're getting to, we'll come back to, which is put in a domestic context at the moment, the, the federal government in the past 12 months um, proposed and introduced a provision which restricted uh, the advocacy of terrorism. Now, that's on the line between incitement to violence and advocacy of contestable and difficult political social ideals uh, and whether violence is a legitimate means to achieve it. What do you think of that? Um, it is on the borderline, but you, you recall that the communist parties in the past the workers' parties and communist parties explicitly rejected democracy. They advocated overturning the liberal democratic political order and the establishment of a workers' dictatorship, a dictatorship for the proletariat. Now, they stopped short of actually uh, advocating or inciting violence against particular individuals. It happened in, in some countries which were not liberal democratic countries. It happened in the, liber the, the liberation uh, movements that resorted to violence were not, I mean, there were small groups like the Baden Meinhof gang and the uh, Red Army Brigade and so on. Uh, they were very, very small groups and they were breaking the law. Uh, but the communist parties themselves were tolerated. Although they, were, they did not believe in the democratic change, they believed in overturning, overthrowing the <laughs> liberal democratic order by force. But they never advocated, they never crossed that line where they said, okay, now take your guns and go and kill, or, or throw bombs. Um, and uh, in some countries it did happen. In, it, it happened in the country I came from, Sri Lanka. It happened in 1971 when a breakaway group of Marxists, uh, Marxists said, okay, enough is enough. We can't change the system. But the Marxists were in government, but they took, they took to arms and they had a month-long rebellion 
killed a few people and got killed themselves. So that's, I think, the difference. To say that uh, this system is terrible, has to be changed, is one thing. To say that go on, go now onto the streets and kill innocent people, throw bombs at them, is another. So I think that's probably where you can draw a line. I mean, it's not easy. Right, we've got a question over there, then here. Oh, it doesn't matter by the order. You can have both of them, don't worry. Mm -hmm. um, I must take you fast about a couple of things you said there. Um, in particular, about this compulsory acquisition. Now, there are three fundamental rights which are life, liberty, and property. And there's also a commandment that says, Thou shalt not steal. So, the only way that anyone can be dispossessed by our rule of law is by the lawful judgment of his equals. Now, this goes back to Maggie Carter, which says very specifically that no free man shall be taken and deed in prison or exiled or outlawed or dispossessed or destroyed in any way, nor shall we cast over him, nor shall we sing over him, unless by the lawful judgment of his equals, which is the law of the land. So, why are you not? promoting trial by jury as the Palladian of liberty to protect all our rights. Um, okay, I, I thought you started off by talking about com uh, uncompensated taking, you know, taking property without compensation. No, there's the other disposition. Okay, now the, re the, the, the difference between robbery and acquiring for public purposes, in my view, this, there are sometimes property needed for a public purpose, and there can be holdouts. Not according to the... Oh, there you go. Well, let's finish it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you may... No, I, I'm talking about the practical need of a government, for example, you know, to build a bridge or whatever. Uh, then there are two alternatives. One is to buy the property. And the other is, if there is a holdout, then to give proper compensation. No, go hang on, hang, hang on. Now, now, Let me now the common law, I know. You cannot get away. Hang on. No, the, 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 there are two, two reasons why you, I would not consider it a violation of the rule of law. One is uh, a genuine need. The second is the question of compensation. If compensation is paid, and if there is a holdout situation, and the property is genuinely needed, and if the person, owned property owner, is not prepared even to pay market value or even more, sometimes they're not even prepared to pay double the market value. Uh, and in that instance, in my personal view, whatever the Magna Carta might say in your interpretation, my, my personal view, it would not be robbery. I, I'm, I'm instinctively against this kind of capacity acquisition, don't get me wrong. but. I wouldn't put it as high as robbery. Thank you, without so, so we're going to move on to the next question from over here. So, sorry, sorry, we're paying mindful of everybody else in the room. So, Professor, I've uh, heard your comments about passion being an attribute of social uh, Can you get the balance right between local compassion and global compassion, particularly when you refer to uh, the need for wealth to create support? to provide compassion with our economy, our world, where do we sit on global standards? Um, I'm, not, I'm, not, uh, sure that you, I'm not sure that I perfectly understood your question. Uh, it is, how do we distinguish local compassion? How do we get the balance right between local compassion and looking globally? Summoning foreign aid, those sorts uh, of things. Okay. The, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a part of human nature that you feel most strongly about those who are nearest and dearest to you than those who are distant. Now, there was a time in past civilization in the past, in our own history, we didn't care about anybody else. We cared about our own kith and kin, our own village, our own country, our own tribe. But we did not care. Actually, we used to eat the other tribes um, <laughs> and rob whatever they had. Um, what mattered was our safety, the tribe's safety. But, but once we started to, you know, 
get civilized, we we extend it to strangers the kind of consideration we extend to our neighbors and our friends and relatives. So it has been growing. And my point here was my point was this: if you don't have, create wealth, you are unable to feel unable to extend compassion. I'm not saying that there has been a change in human nature. You know, from an evolutionary point of view, it might take a million years for the human nature to change. But what has changed is our capacity to show compassion. And countries such as Australia have got to the point where they can extend that compassion beyond their borders. And, they, and, and it is a good thing. But my only other point is this, that how we extend, how we show that compassion, what in, by what instruments we try to set, uh, help others is of, a, of, is of major importance. Uh, I have friends in, in Africa who completely 100% reject the idea of aid. Aid dependence, they say, has become one of the scourges of Africa. You know, the aid goes to governments. Governments get more and more corrupt. It doesn't flow through. So what they say, trade, openness of markets, opening their, opening our markets to African coffee or copper or whatever that they produce is a much more effective way. And investing in those countries is a much more effective ways of helping them than by throwing money at them. Teach them to catch the fish, not just give them the fish. Um, so, um, so that's, for, I mean, my, my only point was that, you know, we are by nature selfish. We first think of ourselves, our tribe, but as we become more prosperous, we, we have the luxury of feeling compassion to each other. The question over here, then let it at the front here. So the, oh. No, no, yeah, this gentleman over here, then this letter here. Rights and this correlative duties. I want to take to the example you said about somebody who's swimming out of the, out of the beach, right? With a right to swim there. Under our law, and say the person is in distress, there's no legal duty as such for anybody on their beach to rescue them as such. And it's taken more of a dramatic example. There was a case in Melbourne a few years back where this woman, I think, violently assaulted. A couple of people walked past and do anything. Another case, just quickly, is that with a reported case in New South Wales, which is a court of appeal, and the judges said that um, this is chap being bashed up outside the restaurant, and they said no, the even restaurant owners didn't have, he didn't, weren't even obliged to even call the police. What I'm trying to say is that in the European countries, and even the Northern Territory, they do have it's mandated by law that you must, you are obliged to assist somebody, legally obliged to assist somebody. If you don't, they face a sanction between sure. the law. What's the question? The point I'm trying to say. And that's the circumstance. Do you think it's appropriate to say they shouldn't support the European ideas that they've been mandated that we do assist other people who are who are distressed? Good Samaritan laws. <laughs> yes. Um, there, there already uh, are a few instances of that in our legal system, as you already pointed out. And uh, one of the most uh, interesting ones is uh, is a duty to go to the assistance of a ship in dis distress. Um, every master of a vessel has that duty if without risking it, the, it, the, his or her own vessel and crew uh, to go to that. Uh, to, uh, so, but there's a moral duty. So there's always a question in a society whether a moral duty should be enacted into a legal duty or not. Sometimes it is best that you leave moral duties as they are without imposing them on. I mean, look, take the free free speech um, question that we're talking about, I wouldn't, I would never have insulted any, any, any person of faith in the manner that some people have provoked and then, uh, then, then, then receive the, you know, the, the reaction. I wouldn't do it. And that's because I don't feel morally right in, in insulting the faith of anybody else. Although I may not, I, I, I mean, almost certainly not share that faith. So it is better, you know, in my view, that that moral obligation, moral duty, will remain a moral obligation 
not enforced by the state through criminal sanctions, through mm -hmm. penal sanctions. Another example of that, of course, the Hippocratic Oath in terms of people's sense of duty to others uh, for doctors. A question here. Now, by any definition, Australia is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And yet we have restrained very quickly the liberty of those seeking asylum here to a far greater extent than actually the poorer countries do in in uh, Europe and the Middle East. Uh, how does that make the start? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I, look, um, if a person is, a, is, is in need of asylum, I think there is a moral duty for us to to take that person or help that person to the best of our ability, of this country's ability. It's a separate question whether people are actually seeking asylum or seeking to migrate for other reasons such as economic reasons. Now, the international law does not recognize the right of a person to migrate to a destination of that person's choice for economic reasons. So if you have open borders, I mean, there was a stage when I was such a libertarian that I did not believe in open borders. I did, I believe in open borders. Uh, but I don't now. Uh, I have not abandoned the compassion for those who need genuinely asylum to escape there are conditions, uh, but I do understand that there is a need to make it orderly. I do understand that if it is disorderly, then the people who suffer most are those who have already been recognized as refugees and are languishing in camps all over the world. So if, it's one of those strange things, you know, the fact that these people can pay, I don't know what the mark going, market value is $10,000 or $20,000 to get on a people smuggling boat and come here. I mean, that was not in, that was inconceivable 10 years ago, 20 years ago. They didn't have money. You know, in poor countries, they were stuck in their villages. They couldn't, they couldn't even get to the capital city. But, you know, this is another consequence of the global creation of wealth. People can actually buy their way across. I think we should also be mindful that while we have a debate about how people should arrive here who may seek asylum, it is not as though there is a debate about whether we should accept asylum seekers or not. And so it's a, they're, they're important and very different questions as well. Does anybody else have any other questions before we close? Hey, well, we'll just wait for the microphone if that's right. So, final question. We were talking here about about rights and liberties, okay, and that basically relates to the and you can have rights and liberties under the rule of law. Now, rule of law and basic rights and liberties are much much more important than democracy. You can have democracy and democracy and democratic governments can erode all these freedoms. What is important is having rights and and, and freedoms. Democracy is one way of protecting them. Checks and balances is, a, is another important way of protecting them. So, so you, I mean, look at a country like, until recently at least, Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong has or had a, a, a very high degree of the rule of law, but no democracy. And its wealth is much, I mean, it's, it's a wealthy country, considering where they started from. Singapore is similar. So there are countries in which democracy is weak, but the rule of law is strong. And I did one know in Singapore, the father of democracy there, I think he established democracy very well. Sure, hang on. I did one know in Singapore. I, 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 point noted, but can we just, do you have any more to add? No, Sorry. All right. Uh, I'm mindful of the time and the fact that most people have probably come during their lunch break. So uh, in closing, um, 
for giving an uh, insightful, interesting, and of course, very well informed philosophical as well as practical talk. Could everybody please thank Dr. Suri for <laughs> that? Thank you, everybody, for coming, and I hope you come to future rights talks. Uh, as I said at the start, my name is Tim Wilson, and we very much welcome you at the Human Rights Commission uh, and hope to continue to engage you into the future. Thank you. Thank you.